Hello everyone, welcome to our first webinar of 2013 Copyright Basics. I want to thank you all for joining us and just let you know that if you have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to submit them through the GoToWebinar software. So today we're going to talk about Copyright Basics. I'm Sarah Morales, a Director of Community Support here at Wikia. And joining me today is one of my team members, Sean McGilvray, a Community Manager's who specializes in legal topics for us here at Wikia. And I also want to say in the background is Trello Rath, who is helping answer all the questions. So I want to thank both Sean and Trello for being here with us to share some of the topics. So what are we going to be talking about? Today we're going to overview copyright and how it impacts you as a contributor to Wikia. Sean's going to lead the majority of this webinar, but like I said, feel free to send in questions. Um, we'll be collecting all of the questions um, and doing a Q&A at the end. During the webinar, Sean's going to start with an overview of what copyright is and what it isn't. He'll then describe the copyrights on Wikia and offer best practices for on your wiki. And then at the end, we'll do a Q&A, so feel free to submit those at any time. So now we'll hand it over to Sean. Thanks, Sarah. So first things first, I should say that uh, I am not a practicing attorney, and this webinar will not be offering any specific legal advice. Uh, what we aim to do is cover sort of the basics of copyright as a concept and how it applies uh, on the internet and to Wikia specifically. So uh, with that out of the way, what exactly is copyright? Well, copyright is a type of intellectual property protection. Uh, this falls in the same bucket as patents and trademarks. Sometimes it's easy to get these concepts mixed up. So a good example of the difference between them, we can see in the picture in front of us. So here's a picture of Eric Clapton playing his guitar. The song he's playing would be covered by copyright because it's creative expression. The guitar that he's playing it on would fall under patent because it's a useful invention. And the maker of the guitar would be protected by trademark law because it identifies the source of the goods. In this case, it would be Les Paul. So you've all seen the circle C, and this is the universal sim symbol for copyright. Uh, it's usually included somewhere on the publication, generally towards the beginning, along with the name of the owner of the copyright and the first year of publication. Uh, that's not strictly required, but you generally do see it. Wikipedia tells us that the formal definition for copyright is a legal concept enacted by most governments, giving the creator of an original work exclusive rights to it, usually for a limited time. Now, we're dealing with U.S. law, and in the U.S., copyright law is governed by federal statute. It's a law written by Congress. Congress gets the authority to make these laws from a specific grant in the Constitution. Uh, it's known as the Progress Clause. To promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So it's important to remember that this was written in the Founding Fathers' times, so some of the language and phraseology that they use is a little bit different. Uh, in the course of the progress clause, when they say science, they mean something more like all knowledge, including philosophy and literature. It's not necessarily restricted to what we would think of as science. And when they say useful arts, they don't really mean artistic endeavors, uh, but rather crafts and technology, what we would probably think of today as science. So it's a little bit backwards. But the main takeaway is that because of this clause, Congress can give a creator a monopoly over their creation. Uh, and that monopoly allows them to do certain things with it and restrict others from doing certain things with it. So under this authority, Congress passed the Copyright Act of 1976. This was the first major overhaul of copyright law since 1909. Uh, before that, there was a mix of, of federal and state copyright law. Uh, and it was later revised by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is something we will be discussing in uh, slightly more detail later. 
So what exactly does the Copyright Act give to copyright owners? Well, when we're talking about intellectual property, we're not talking about real property that can be fenced off. So when we talk about ownership in this context, we're talking about control. Specifically, there's what we call a bundle of rights, uh, specific avenues that you can control when it comes to your creative work. These rights are the right to distribute the work, to prepare derivative works from it, things like translations or adaptations, to reproduce the work, to perform the work, and to display the work publicly. There are a few more that mostly have to do with uh, sound transmissions. We're not gonna get too deeply into that today. So let's look at an example. Let's say you've written a fantasy novel. Under copyright law, you have the right to distribute it. That means you can sell it to a publisher or print it on your own. You have the right to make derivative works. That means you can create a screenplay based on the novel or translate it into Spanish or a different language. You can reproduce it, make a bunch of copies for your local library or for giveaway. You can perform the work by giving a reading of the first chapter. Or you can display it, although that usually comes up more for paintings and works of visual art. So it's called the Progress Clause because Congress decided that it was a good idea to promote creation, that it's, it's a public good if people have the incentive to add to the sum total of knowledge. They want to give an incentive to create. Uh, it's to promote progress. So by giving these rights to creators, they will therefore be more likely to add to the public discourse. Uh, it gives them the right to sell the work and keep others from selling it. Now, this ri these rights can be given to someone for free or they can be sold. And when you transfer these, lights, these rights, it's generally known as a license. If someone does one or more of these things to your work without your permission, i.e. without a license, uh, it's called copyright infringement. Uh, if the copyright owner succeeds in a copyright infringement claim, once it goes to court, uh, there can be court awarded penalties covering lost profits from the copying or even statutory damages uh, that can get quite high, possibly even attorney's fees. Sometimes there can even be uh, court orders requiring that the infringing copies of the material has to be destroyed. Uh, this happened just recently with the video game company Silicon Knights, who had to destroy uh, several existing copies of its game X-Men Destiny because of a copyright infringement claim. Uh, in the internet setting, this would generally only come after the DMCA takedown process has been exhausted, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. So what types of things are covered by copyright law? Well, it applies to original works of authorship. And in terms of what is covered, that means pretty much everything, specifically literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other intellectual works. All it has to be is a creative expression. And we're talking about a minimal amount of creativity. Uh, it basically has to be more creative than a phone book. There's also no quality standard. The crudest stick figure drawing you do in the margins of your college algebra notebook uh, receives the same copyright protection as the most recent issue of Superior Spider-Man. So does a work have to be published to qualify for copyright protection? No, it does not. Anything that is fixed in a non-transitory medium, that means written down, typed, drawn, recorded. Uh, this even includes, in some cases, uh, the random access memory of your computer, which means the copyright affixes when you type it. Uh, this means that Technically, you own the copyright to your edits on Wikia before you even hit publish. Does it have to be registered? No. The copyright applies as soon as you write it down, although there are certain benefits that come from registration, and it is a requirement if you do find yourself in a position where you have to sue for copyright infringement, but it's not a requirement. So back to the fantasy novel example. Is it copyrightable? Yes, it is. It's a literary work, therefore, that is a copyrightable expression. When does it happen? As soon as you type it up. And what do you have to do to make sure that the copyright applies? Nothing. You just type it. You don't have to fill out anything 
or mail in any box tops. <laughs> so that's a pretty wide net. What are things that are not covered by copyright law? Facts are not covered. Uh, actual facts out in the world. The combination of words and the structure used to describe them might be. So a specific news article would be protected, but the facts it's reporting would not be. Things like ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, concepts, principles, or discoveries are not protectable. There's a concept in copyright law called the idea expression dichotomy. That's a fancy way of saying that expression gets protected, but ideas don't. Useful articles can't be copyrighted and neither can titles, names, short phrases, or slogans, although they might qualify as trademarks. Uh, same for familiar symbols or designs. Also listings of ingredients or content uh, such that in a recipe, the actual ingredient list would probably not qualify while the instructions for how to make the dish would. Copyright also does not apply to things in the public domain. The public domain is a fancy word for the sum total of all works that either never had copyright protection or that no longer have it now. Uh, it's something that has to be stated explicitly and just because you found it on the internet doesn't mean it counts as public domain or just because it's old. So here are some examples. You can't copyright the, uh, the fact that the sky is blue. The idea expression dichotomy. If you give an elevator pitch of your idea for a screenplay, that is not copyrightable, but the actual screenplay itself is. The back cover synopsis of a book may or may not be but the book itself would be. In an economics paper, the paper itself would be protected, but not the theory that it describes. For useful items, things like wrenches, uh, cars can't be copyrighted, although in some cases, the specific designs can be. Titles, names, or slogans, like the title of your novel, and symbols or designs, like the familiar symbols or designs, like the stop sign or religious symbols. Uh, and recipes or tables of content. So copyright law is a very complicated area and there are a lot of things that we just don't have the time or the scope to discuss, but now I'm going to mention a few of these other concepts very briefly just to touch on them. So the term of copyright, how long does it last? If it starts when you type it, when does it end? This is actually a very difficult and complicated question and the course of legislation tells us that it'll get even more complicated, but for right now, the short answer is that if the work was created after 1978 by a single person, the copyright will last for the life of the author plus 70 years. And when that term is over, the work will enter the public domain. Uh, copyright law is primarily handled by civil law, which means that generally speaking, you're more likely to be sued than to go to jail. Although there are criminal penalties that apply in certain cases. There is a concept called works for hire or works made for hire, which means that ordinarily the copyright for anything that you create vests in you, it belongs to you. But works that are prepared by an employee within the scope of their job actually belong to the employer. So this is why a Spider-Man artist doesn't own the copyright to the comic page that he drew. Uh, famously, the creators of Superman signed a work for hire agreement for the character when they first created him, and they essentially sold their rights in the character for around $130. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this is only applies for works that you create in the scope of your employment. So if you work at McDonald's and you happen to write a poem while you're working the drive through chances are McDonald's isn't going to assert a copyright interest in it. There's also something called the first sale doctrine. This is basically the idea that although the specific rights we've talked about earlier still apply, you can sell your physical copy of a creative work. So when you buy a book or a movie, you can resell that specific copy on Amazon or eBay. Uh, this is actually what keeps stores like GameStop in business is the first sale doctrine because it allows you 
to sell the physical copy of the game that you bought without infringing the copyright of the publisher. So all of the things we've talked about so far were generally products of an age wherein copying technology was not much more complicated than the printing press. The internet changed everything as it usually does. Uh, it made copying a lot easier and a lot more widespread. So the government has been trying to keep up, but there's been lots of changes and it's been hard to do. Uh, so they've been dealing with things like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, file lockers, the fact that basically everything you do on the computer involves creating some sort of copy. One answer they had was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. Uh, this came out in 1998 to address some of the issues unique to digital copyright. One of the main facets of the DMCA is that it puts responsibility on the copyright owner to seek out and find possible infringements. When they do, there's a process of notice, takedown, counter notice, and restoration, which we'll explain in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But for now, just know that there's a system in place to deal with copyright infringements. Internet service providers like Wikia, who follow these provisions, qualify for what's called a safe harbor. This means that we are not liable for the copyright infringements of our users as long as we follow these policies and keep a clear repeat infringer policy in place. It's a very mechanical process. Uh, the DMCA also included other provisions that forbid the circumvention of digital protection and copyright management information. Basically, it made it a crime to either crack DRM or sell devices designed to crack DRM. This is one of the more controversial aspects of the law, but it's not something that we're going to explore in very great detail today. So, for example, if someone copies the text of a fantasy novel and a wiki contains direct copying of that text, the copyright holder, generally the author, possibly the publisher, would find that content on Wikia. They would then send Wikia a DMCA notice at which point Wikia would remove the content. Once the content is taken down, the user who uploaded it can file a counter notice if they believe that the DMCA takedown notice was invalid or sent an error. After that, things get slightly more unpredictable and only when that process is exhausted do possible litigation follow. So one reason that someone might want to file a counter notice is because they believe that their use of the material qualifies as a fair use. Fair use is a doctrine that permits limited use of copyright material without getting permission or a license from the owner. The practical effect of fair use is that it's usually possible to quote or directly copy from a copyrighted work as long as you're doing it in certain fundamentally prescribed ways. Generally, if you're doing it to criticize or comment upon it, teach people about it, parody it, or research it. And there's a few other uses as well. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the internet as we know it today could not exist without the doctrine of fair use. Fair use is a very powerful idea, but it generally gets treated in one of two overly extreme ways. Copyright owners like to forget that it exists and be overly zealous in defending any use of their material, even when the use would qualify. On the other hand, some internet users take it as an excuse for blanket copying and think it gives them the right to infringe copyright with impunity. Neither of these views is accurate. The true doctrine of fair use lies somewhere in the middle. So fair use gives you the ability to use some aspects of a copyrighted work. But how much is too much? Well, unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Uh, there are certain guideposts we can look for, but different courts have interpreted the doctrine differently. In general, there are four factors that control whether something would or would not qualify as a fair use. And these are important things to keep in mind as you're pondering directly copying a work. So the first is the purpose and character of the use. 
Uh, this means generally how you're using it. The second is the nature of the copyrighted work. Uh, is it published? Is it unpublished? Is it fact? Is it fiction? Works of fiction generally get a higher standard. Uh, we also look at the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. This basically means that you look at how much of it and how important the section that you used was in relation to the entire work. And the last factor is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. This basically means that if the way you're using it will hurt the potential sales of the original copyrighted material, then it's much less likely to qualify as a fair use. So overall, the factors boil down to a consideration of how transformative the use is and whether the use complements or replaces the original work. So back to the fantasy novel. Some things would be much more likely to qualify as fair use than others. Things like brief quotes or character descriptions on the pages for those characters, uh, thumbnail images of the characters, those would be very likely to qualify. Things like entire chapters would be much less likely. Uh, the longer the passage, the less likely it is to apply. One area that generally tends to be seen as qualifying for fair use is screenshots from the video games that you're playing. Uh, so we see a lot of those on Wikia. So you can see the example here is from the Peter Parker page from the Marvel Wiki. And there's a quote uh, of Peter quoting his Uncle Ben and an image from the comic. This is almost certainly qualifies as a fair use. So how does this all apply on Wikia? Well, when you sign up for an account and you contribute to the wikis, you agree to use the CC by SA license. You will see this at the bottom of every page. This means, as we talked about earlier, you're granting a license to Wikia and the rest of the world to use, reuse, or recreate the content or create derivative works from it, but you still own the copyright to it. You've just given permission. We use the CC by SA license, but there are a few other Creative Commons licenses. There's the CC by NC, which means Creative Commons attribution non-commercial, which means it's okay to use the work as long as it's for a non-profit or non-commercial industry. There is the non-derives, which means that it's okay to use it, but not make derivative works, which we talked about earlier. And there's a few other combinations, but those are the basic concepts. So these all come from the Creative Commons, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing easy ways for people to share and use their knowledge and creativity while still reserving some, but not all, of the standard protections of copyright. We actually did a webinar with them last March, which you can listen to on the webinar page. So as we mentioned, licensing means giving your work to the world with special requirements. The one that we use here on Wikia is the CC by SA license. This gives free permission, but adds stipulations of attribution and share alike, which means that anyone can use, reuse, or remix the work as long as the original authors are attributed. And as long as it is released under, as long as the new work is released under the same license. Failure to follow these guidelines, these license requirements, actually makes it copyright infringement. But as long as they're adhered to, not all copying is forbidden. So in terms of copying, there's generally two kinds that apply to this conversation. There is one wiki copying another. This is okay as long as there is attribution. The types of attribution there can use would be a link to the original wiki or original page and a list of all the, and or a list of all the authors that contributed to it. Uh, if, there, if content is being reused without attribution, a good first step is to let the admins of the wiki know, and if they fail to act, you can inform us at Special Contact and we'll look into it further. 
The other way it might come up is if an outside website is copying content from your wiki. Uh, again, this is okay as long as they adhere to the license requirements and release it under a similar license and attribute the authors. If they're not doing these things, there's the two same basic approaches. There's the soft initial approach where you can talk to the admins or the people who run the website and leave a friendly note explaining the issue and presenting them with options on how to credit you properly. Uh, many times the lack of attribution is unintentional because they perhaps didn't understand the license requirements. If that fails or you feel like starting with the big guns, you can send them a DMCA takedown notice. So while the CC by SA license does permit copying, it should generally be used only in cases what permit direct copying. It should generally only be used in cases where there is a real reason for it instead of creating original content. So one of these ideal cases would be translation, uh, which is a type of derivative work. This would be creating wiki pages in another language. Uh, or it could be taking wiki pages about a novel and adding them into a wiki, a separate wiki dedicated to the film created from that novel. Uh, another ideal use would be making discrete, discrete connections between similarly situated subjects. Things like adding info from the Marvel wiki to the Captain America wiki and vice versa. Those are all sort of the ideal test cases that we would like to see copying occur under. So the easiest and best way to do direct copying of content is to use the import export tool. This is the best way because it leaves the edit history intact and ensures that the license requirements of attribution are met. Uh, so that's interwiki copying. If you're copying content from other sites, it is very important to make sure that the content you're trying to use is available under a compatible license or in the public domain, or you have permission to use it, or the way that you intend to use it will qualify as a fair use. So one of the main areas where we see the fair use concept come up and copyright concerns as well involves images. Uh, images on Wikia do not necessarily need to be under the CC by SA license. They don't automatically fall under that license the same way that text contributions do, which is part of the reason why we like to see public domain or freely licensed material. Uh, it's important to pay attention to the licensing dropdowns when you add images to a wiki because they can offer different ways of articulating the rationale behind using that image. Most uses of an image will probably qualify as a fair use, especially in the context of something like a video game, television show, or movie. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule, so it's important to be able to at least articulate and think about why it could qualify. Now, some wikis have different options for this sort of image tagging. Uh, communities are always free to make their own more restrictive local rules than others. There is no as long as it's more restrictive and not less restrictive. Uh, you can see an example here from the Call of Duty wiki where they specifically mention some of the requirements they look for when it comes to adding media. And it very clearly articulates and spells out exactly what they're looking for. Here we see an example of a file page uh, from RuneScape and you notice in the licensing section, you can see that they articulate a fair use rationale. Now, if the owner of the copyright happened to disagree with that fair use rationale, then they could send us a DMCA notice, we would remove it, and a counter notice could be filed from that point. So bringing it all together, what are some best practices to keep in mind for your communities? Well, it's important to pay attention to where you're getting your content from. Does it the source of the content have a compatible license? If so, make sure that you follow the terms, whether it be attribution or share alike. Uh, if not, and it's not 
in the public domain or otherwise freely available, you need to at least be able to make the argument that it qualifies as a fair use. You should also pay attention to how you're displaying the content. By that I mean, is your use of the content the heart of the article, or is it used to explain, illustrate, or clarify a point? Uh, you can look at your local community policies for things like image licensing or copyright problems. It's okay to be more restrictive and require a higher standard. Uh, some wikis have a higher risk tolerance than others, and some wikis deal with subject matter that require less, inter that require, <laughs> some wikis have a higher risk tolerance than others, and some deal with subject matter that generally have more accepted and mapped out ideas of fair use, and it's more widely accepted. When using images, be sure to look at the licensing dropdowns and tag appropriately. When you're using this material, make sure you can articulate the reasoning for the fair use. In general, <clears throat> it's important to respect others' copyrights. So do not copy material that isn't freely licensed, public domain, or a fair use. It's always better to add original material. On the other hand, don't be scared. You can always ask for help either from your community leaders or special contact. Uh, and it's easy to remove material if it becomes necessary. The worst case scenario for posting material without permission is generally a DMCA takedown notice that comes to Wikia and the material is taken down. Assuming there's not repeated copyright infringements, that is generally the worst case scenario. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Um, for that thorough explanation, we have um, a decent amount of questions from the crowd, but also feel free to keep submitting them. I'm going to kind of group together some of those that um, tend to um, kind of fall in with each other. So um, there's some questions from admins kind of relating to, um, say, someone on their wiki um, commits copyright infringement. Um, what should what could happen to this person and what should the admin do? Well, again, it would be important in that case to consider whether what they did might qualify as a fair use. Generally, from our perspective, we see DMCA complaints come in from copyright holders. Uh, the DMCA actually places the responsibility on them to police infringements. Now, to answer your question specifically, if they violated community guidelines or you really don't think it is a fair use, uh, removing the material should be more than enough. We do have policies in place to deal with repeat infringers. So it would be important to make sure that you explain what happened to the user and try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I think um, some of they are asking, should you block, email, warn them? I think starting with a warning is always um, good and an explanation. As you can see, um, Sean just skimmed the surface of copyright uh, in this webinar. It, it does get complex and it's, it's pretty confusing. So give people the benefit of the doubt that they don't really know. Um, and a lot of people, especially online, don't even consider things like copyright. So I think um, the most important thing is to assume good faith and try to explain to them and to have some of those local policies that you can kind of point to. So actually, sorry, to go back uh, to the question, assuming that on this in this uh, example that the material had been removed due to a DMCA, request, if you're asking, should there be an extra level of punishment for the user? Uh, the answer is generally not. Warning and explaining is enough. And Wikia does have policies to deal with re repeat infringers. So I thought it could be interpreted in that way. Now for DMCA, um, folks are asking, do wikis receive them? Do you want to explain a little bit? Uh, they generally shouldn't. Uh, it might happen by mistake. But Wikia is the host for user-generated content. So as imagined by the DMCA, all the takedown notices should come to us. So if you get them on your wiki, uh, please feel free to forward them to special contact. Uh, Wikia ha is considered an inter internet service provider because we're a hosting platform uh, for user-generated content. Yeah, so because of that, you can send, if you do hear anyone or you have any questions, just send them into special contact or email 
community at Wakia, and they will likely go to Sean, who will happily um, answer them. Okay, a couple of other questions on um, copyright. So, um, is content covered by CC by NCSA, so the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike License, able to be imported to another site with a similar CC license, but with a commercial aspect? Well, um, it's hard to answer that specifically. Uh, generally, some of the Creative Commons licensing requirements that you can add do conflict with others. Uh, in terms of Wikia, for the few wikis we do have that have non-commercial attributes to the license, there is in fact a waiver in place that allows uh, some that allows Wikia, let for example, to advertise. Um, and it's also important to remember that those rights can in fact be waived. So it is possible, but without knowing the specifics, it's hard to answer that in any more detail. Okay. Um, now, can someone create, uh, or can we create our own license copyright in the context of a new wiki? Generally speaking, no. We don't allow new wikis to use any license other than the CC by SA. Okay. How about if someone makes an image for you, who has the rights, you or them? If, <clears throat> if someone makes an image for you, then you would generally be considered their employer. It would be a commissioned work. So we talked about works made for hire. There are a lot of boringly detailed uh, considerations that would go into analyzing if it was definitely a work made for hire or not. But the short answer is that assuming it would be a work made for hire, then the person who commissioned it, uh, in this example, it would be you would own the copyright. Okay, and this actually um, kind of relates the first sale doctrine. Um, does first sale doctrine apply to digital versions of things, items? <laughs> no, it doesn't because when I buy a physical copy of Assassin's Creed 3 at the game store, I can hold it in my hands. And when I resell it, I no longer have access to it. That's not necessarily true with digital files. If I give someone a copy, I still have the original copy. So it's a whole different mindset. The first sale doctrine uh, came from a time when there were physical goods. It's one of those digital issues that uh, weren't necessarily accounted for in early copyright law. And with the DMCA, um, you mentioned the cracking DRM cracking, that's specifically so that people can't resell? Uh, generally, yeah. A lot of rights holders will include DRM or digital rights management, which is a way of actually locking and preventing users from creating or selling copies of that material. And under the DMCA, it is a crime to break that protection. Okay. Now, um, someone's asking, uh, so script files, like JavaScript, what is the, do you know the relation between script files and copyright? Sure. Well, co computer code is copyrightable. Absolutely. Uh, so when you, it, it would be like any other text uploaded on Wikia. When you create it, you do own the copyright, but you also license it. Okay. Um, does watermarking an image make you the copyright owner? No. If you created the image, you're the copyright owner as soon as you fix it in a transitory medium. So as soon as you draw it or photograph it or create it on your computer, you own the copyright. Watermarking it or adding a copyright notice can let other people know, but it doesn't necessarily affect when the copyright vests. Okay. Um, another good question here, which is very relevant to Ikea. So how do you handle a game that allows users to create in-game content? Do you need permission from the game or the user who created it? So a lot of our games are kind of also have their own UGC. Or a lot of our wikis cover UGC type games. So at a basic level, I would say that most screenshots that you would take in-game 
would generally be likely to qualify as a fair use. Uh, specifically in things like Minecraft or user-generated games, you would want to pay attention to what they call the EULA or the End User License Agreement which is the license agreement that you have with the game company. Uh, some game companies probably have different policies than others, and some are generally more zealous about defending that sort of thing than others. Okay. So best bet, ask the person who created the game or the user, or you're likely to just assume it's fair use? It's hard to say for sure. I would say that more than likely any sort of screenshot of such a thing would qualify as fair use, but if you want to be cautious, uh, it would be a good idea to look at the end user license agreement for the game. Okay. Um, how about logo? So someone asked like, hey, if I want to take Facebook's logo and adjust their logo and put it on my wiki and say, I heard Facebook or change the color and say my face or something, what happens with logos? Or is that a whole nother world? So logos are interesting in that they qualify for both copyright and trademark protection. So it sort of opens up two cans of worms. Uh, as far as changing them and remixing them, uh, you are generally creating a derivative work from the original logo. Uh, that may or may not be a fair use if you're doing it to parody or comment on whatever company's logo you're using. Uh, that would be up to the company to decide whether or not they see that as an infringement. But they might be more concerned about the trademark aspect of it, especially if it's an internet company and they see another website with a very similar logo to theirs. So I would say that using a logo like that would open yourself up on two separate fronts. Mm -hmm. So depending on the risk tolerance of your wiki, it's definitely something to think about. Okay. Um, and I think as you've mentioned the words derivative works, and there's a question here, which I think what they're trying to get at is what, how do you actually qualify something as a derivative? So what's the difference between copying work and rewriting work in a DMCA respect? So when I say copying, I'm talking about direct copying. If I, if I burn a copy of uh, you know, of a movie or an album, I've directly copied it. If I if I cut and paste the text of a novel, I've directly copied it. If I take the plot of a novel and then write a screenplay based on that, I've created a derivative work. If I translate an English novel into Spanish, I've created a derivative work. If I create a painting of Ezio Auditore from Assassin's Creed, I've created a derivative work. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know a little bit more about music and video copyright and, you know, if they want to remix, say you want to take all the best scenes from Assassin's Creed video and remix it and put it on your wiki. Do you have to have any concerns there? Well, So if the question is about the interaction between the, the music being used and the video gameplay, that can get a little complicated and it's probably beyond the scope of what we're discussing today. I would say that generally uh, brief snippets of gameplay used to illustrate certain points would be a likely contender for a fair use consideration. So there is definitely room to make that argument. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that, generally speaking, uh, video game publishers see the value in having an active and engaged fan base. And they like to see that the people who play their games are excited enough to make these kind of videos. Okay. One thing, actually, that reminds me we can mention is... Um the last at the end of uh, December, we did a webinar on videos. Um, and one of the things we mentioned is that we've actually created a video library, video.wakia.com, which has a bunch of licensed videos that you can all use. So there, um, what we've done is we've licensed these videos. We're working with video content providers. So we have the legal right to display them on Wikia. Uh, a lot of times you'll see wikis that have used YouTube videos. And on YouTube, there's often 
getting sent DMCA's. I'm sure all of you have gone and seen this. You click to watch a video and says this video has been taken down. Um, and that's because they were likely served with the DMCA and YouTube had to take it down. Um, the videos from VideoWiki, we have the license right to display them. So if you are interested in getting legally licensed videos that won't get taken down on you, I strongly encourage you to check out there. We actually have a bunch of interviews, gameplay, and it's something we're actively uh, building. So you'll see more and more there over the next year. So um, if you are looking for video, I encourage you to look there first um, before you go somewhere like YouTube, because you are likely to see a lot of that content getting taken down. Um, that was all the questions. I don't know if Sean had any final point um, to make. I think we covered a lot. I want to thank um, both Sean and Trella for being here and helping. Sean is actually battling the flu. So it's amazing he was able to be here and do such a great job. So thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. Uh, just a shout out to Community Central, community.wakia.com. All of our past webinars are there, and this one will be there soon, as well as some how-to videos that you can watch for learning to participate in Wikia. We also have our staff blog where all important announcements and, and tips are released, the community forum, uh, live chat, and a lot more. So I want to thank everyone for coming out um, and participating in the webinar. And if you do have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to um, get them to us on Community Central, and we'll be happy to answer them. So thank you, everyone. Have a uh, wonderful week and happy editing on your wikis. Bye, everyone.